evening. God bless you, Maurice. God bless you, Juanita. God bless you. Amen. Welcome, everyone, to tonight's Bible study. Amen. We're going to begin shortly. I want you to take this opportunity to share the video with those on your page so that they'll know that we're on. Good evening, Laverne. Good evening, Evangelist Bella. God bless you all. Amen. God bless you, Eloise. God bless you, Nicole. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you, Cynthia. Good evening. Good evening. How you doing, Elder Nicole? God bless you. Amen. We're going to begin shortly. Please share it on your page. God bless you, Ruby. Amen. Good evening. God bless you, Joanne. God bless you, Eloise. Amen. God bless you, Angela. Juanita, God bless you. Camille, God bless you. Good evening to each and every one of you. <clears throat> God bless you, Laverne. God bless you, Ruby and Angela. God bless you. Amen. We're going to begin in about 30 seconds, so please grab your Bibles, your pens, your pads, your tablets, laptops, whatever you need. Grab it so you can take copious notes. Amen. I want you to take this opportunity to share the video with those on your page so they'll know that we're on. And we're going to begin in prayer shortly, asking God for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I thank God for this opportunity. God bless you, Isaiah, my brother. How are you? Amen. Thank God for this opportunity of sharing with you all and for this privilege for us all to study the Word of God. For the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. And so we thank God for it. You know, apart from the Word, we can do nothing. But with the Lord, through the Lord, and by the Lord, we can do all things. God bless you, Siobhan. Amen. And so let's let's begin. <clears throat> Let's begin to pray, asking God for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And so God bless you all. Amen. So let's begin to pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. We thank you for life, health, and strength. God, we thank you for your wisdom, your knowledge, and your understanding. And Father, we thank you for your word, for your word is truth. It's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. Father, we glorify you tonight and we give you honor and praise. God, we bless your name for this season, this season that most are celebrating Thanksgiving. But God, we thank you every single day for, apart from you, God, we would have been lost. We would have been destroyed a long time ago, but we are grateful for your mercy and your grace. And so, Father, grant unto us wisdom tonight. Give us free flow in your word and Allow us to speak freely of your truths that we might gain a knowledge and an understanding so that we might live a life that pleases you. Father, we want to be pleasing in your sight. We want to walk before you humbly. We want to walk before you holy. God, we want to walk before you with excellence. So bless us even now. I pray that you would dispel all myths and that, God, you would break um, past every yoke of bondage. Lord God, remove blindness and stubbornness. Remove, Lord God, rebellion and ignorance. I pray in Jesus' name that, Father, you would give us holy wisdom tonight and that, Father, you would open up our understanding. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence. So guide us here tonight. Lead us and guide us and comfort us and give us understanding. We thank you and we bless you for your word is excellent. It is pure. Your word is, 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 is never conflicting, Lord God, but your word is, in, is in inerrant, it is infallible. Your word is just, it is pure, and we thank you for your word. So God, guide us tonight. Bless every minister, pastor, elder, bishop, apostle. Bless every layperson, every prayer warrior. Bless every minister of music. Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would open up our hearts open up our hearts tonight to be fed by you. We thank you, Lord God, and we glorify you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming tonight. I thank you for 
this opportunity of sharing with you and for you taking out time out of your schedule to sit with me. Y'all, listen, let me tell you something. You know, lately I've been so inundated, so busy, and, and so just not overwhelmed, but just stretched, stretched almost to the limit. But God is faithful. He is faithful to not put more on us than we can handle or bear. But we have to exercise wisdom. We have to exercise wisdom. And so tonight, you know, I want to share with you all out of the word of God. And we want to talk about the prepared minister, the prepared minister. Listen, as I, you know, from, from my church to other churches to um, places that I've traveled to around the world, um, I see a lot of people ministering, even on Facebook and YouTube, they're ministering, but they're not prepared. They're not prepared. And what do I mean by prepared? Not just what most people are talking about, because most people, when it comes to being prepared or talking about being prepared, most people talk about seminary. They talk about any school of higher learning. They talk about, um, you know, some Bible institute or Bible class, or they got some certificate on the wall, or, or you know, they have an ordination license, or they have a ministerial license. Um, they have all those things, right? But listen, those things don't necessarily prepare you for ministry. Um, and so tonight, and probably over the next couple of nights, maybe even this entire week, I want to talk about the prepared minister. Um, I want to talk about the, the minister, for we all are ministers in one form or another. Um, some of you are ministers of music. Some of you are ministers in prayer. Some of you are ministers preaching the gospel, teaching the gospel. Some of you are Sunday school teachers. Some of you may be evangelists. Some of you may be pastors, um, apostles. You know, I want us to take this opportunity and these opportunities that we will have, God's willing, to sort of delve into the word to see what does the word say to ministers and maybe some things that you have not considered. Um, I would like for you, that's why I want you to take copious notes. I want, I want you to take notes because of the fact of that we must understand that we must, the Bible says that God will say to the people who are faithful, to the people who have done the right thing, he will say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. In fact, when people quote the scripture in Isaiah that says no weapon formed, when they quote the scripture saying no weapon formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against me in judgment we shall condemn, the word of God says this is the inheritance of the servants of the Lord. So, you know, a lot of people are quoting these things, but you're not serving the Lord. You're serving your own purposes. You're serving the purposes of maybe your church. Maybe you're serving purposes of your pastor. Maybe you're trying to please them. But tonight, and, and we want to start off this teaching really going deeply into what does it mean to be prepared? What does it mean to be prepared as a minister? There are certain things that the Word of God speaks of that really um, goes against what we see in a lot of cultures and what we see even in a lot of churches, right? Um, being a minister is not just that you know how to talk or that you can teach people something or you can share something or you have an idea. But one of the things that I want you to understand, and, and before we go into our word um, tonight, I want you to understand this. Think about this, right? Um, to, to minister, right, is not where you do a whole, where you have a list of do's or things that you're doing or things that you're adding or something that you believe God has called you to do. That's not ministry from the, from the, the depths of ministry. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, there's a lot of people, and this is why we get into this mindset of exalting one office over another. This is why we get into this mindset of exalting, well, this person is a, a pastor, but this person is a bishop, and this person is an apostle, and this person is a prophet, and this person is this or that. Listen, let me, hear you, let me tell you tonight. 
the, this concept of ministry that we have is, is based oftentimes on a humanistic flesh mindset that, that says that I'm greater because of my ability. Right now, the Bible talks specifically saying that God has set each members each in their places. And guess what? The Bible says that the body grows when each member does their part. OK, so when I'm walking, my legs are doing the walking, but my legs are not more valuable than my heart. It's not more vi valuable than my lungs. It's not more valuable than my stomach. It's not more valuable than my brain. It is important to know that there's a lot of people, the scripture says he called the old because they know the way and he called the young because they're strong. He says, but, but, but my concept behind that is what good is knowing the way if you don't have the strength to get there? And what good is having strength if you don't know where you're going? So none of us are isolated and set apart from one another. None of us can say that we are the creme de la creme, that we are the HNIC, that we are the top dog, that we're on top of the totem pole. Because even if you, if God has placed you on the top, those underneath you is holding you up there. It is important to know that we have so much arrogance and so much pride. And that's why even with some pastors, some pastors, when I when I share with them or I meet pastors and we talk about, you know, I, they say, oh, what church are you pastoring? And, and I tell them one of the first questions that a lot of pastors will ask me is how many members do you have? What does that matter? What does it matter if I have 5,000 or if I have 500? What does it matter? It doesn't matter, but the, the fact is our mindsets are so earthbound and we're so caught up in flesh until we think that one office is better than another. We think that, you know, and I'm going to tell you, many of us, oh yes, Teresa, that's what Jesus said. And it's amazing that in spite of the fact that Jesus says that the greatest among you would be the servant of all, the fact is, is that most most people going into ministry are looking to be served. They're looking to be served and not realize that when God is calling you higher, he's calling you to give more. To whom much is given, much is required. And, and, and a lot of people think that when I get to the top, then I'm going to have my own way. No, 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 no. Listen, let me tell you something. When I was in college, when I was in college, you know, my thought was to get a career, to have this fantastic career so that I could, you know, uh, control certain departments. And I wanted to go into management and I wanted to go into uh, presidency and I wanted to go into all these things, CEO, COO. I wanted to go into those things. Right. But the higher you got in corporate America, the higher I got in corporate America, I realized there was always somebody hiring me. So so most people say, well, you know, I'm going to go until I become the president. But then when you become a president. President, your stockholders are your bosses. Your board, your board of directors are your bosses, right? The consumers are your bosses, right? And then many folks say, well, I'm going to go out there and start my own business. Then your clients are your bosses, right? So the higher you go, the more people you have that has a voice to say about you. You know, I was sharing with, um, at, at my church, I, I teach the ministers a lot and some of them receive it. Some of them receive it and they grow with it and some of them fight with it, right? And the ones who fight with it grow slow. The one who receive it and learn from it, they grow faster. But here's the point. When you minister, ministry is not about you having your way. It's about you giving up completely your way and being obedient to God. So the higher you go, and a lot of folks don't understand, they don't understand why, you know, I'll preach a sermon and then the Holy Spirit will tell me, go home and get in bed. A lot of people don't understand why, you know, um, I minister and the Holy Spirit said, now I need to talk to you. And then I don't hang out in the crowds. I don't go and, and, and get all the applause and get all the people that's trying to boost you up and trying to tell you you're a great person. Because the Bible says, beware when men speak well of you. It is important to know 
that when you are a minister of Jesus Christ, when you are a minister of God, when you are what most people use as these phraseology, bless you, man of God, bless you, woman of God. When you are a woman of God, a man of God, there are responsibilities and there are accountabilities that you have to everyone that you minister. It is ridiculous that we have ministers who are women's presidents or men's presidents, but you don't like all women. Or you don't like all men. You pick and choose who you like. You pick and choose who you're going to be patient with. You pick and choose who you're going to love and who you're going to spend time with and who you're going to talk. That's not a minister. It's like pastors. How can a pastor hate another pastor? How can a pastor hate and be jealous of another pastor when we're both serving the one true living God? And if I am a pastor, if I'm truly a man of God, and if I'm truly a pastor, the Holy Spirit that have called me to this office will not allow me to harbor jealousy, envy, or, or, or uh, anger against any man, woman, boy, or girl. Doesn't matter what they do. But it's amazing to me that there's a lot of people that want to get in ministry, but yet and still you haven't let go of your anger. You want to get in ministry. Oh, yeah, you're educated. You're educated. Yes, you got all the doctor's degrees on the wall. You got all those things. You got all the master's degrees. You got all your, your degrees and certificates for theology. And you got all these uh, biblical surveys. And, 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 and you got a library of books behind you. But you ain't got spirit enough of Jesus Christ in you to show that you truly are a minister. It, it, it's amazing to me. And, and, and I, I ask God, Lord, forgive me and forgive all of the pastors who have not told people the truth from to their face that you cannot love God whom you have not seen and not love that difficult brother or sister who you do see. Don't tell me that you love Jesus Christ and you are angry with that person. You don't want to talk to that person. You avoid that person. Don't tell me that you have a right relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't tell me you have a right relationship with Jesus Christ and you are underneath a pastor and that pastor give you a direction and that pastor gives you the word of God, but you're sitting at home gossiping about him and you're sitting at home uh, destroying his ministry. You're sitting at home mocking the things that he do and you think you have a right relationship with God. My brother, my sister, you ain't walking with the Holy Ghost. You ain't walking with the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost, when you bow on your knees to pray and say, God, help me with my rent. He's going to say, wait, before I help you with your rent, stop talking about your brother. Go and repent. Before I bless your food, go and repent. That's the Holy Ghost I serve. Now, I don't know what Holy Ghost a lot of people serve. You know, some people, I don't think, I think the Holy Ghost they, they serve is holy, not holy as far as pure and, and separate and set apart, but I'm saying filled with holes. Filled with holes. That, that, that spirit that they're serving is filled with holes. It's not God's spirit because God's spirit will not allow me to pray over my food, and I got an attitude with somebody. If I have an attitude with somebody, if I if somebody did something to me that I didn't like, and I was holding in my heart a little bit of anger, as soon as I bow my head to pray over my food, the Holy Ghost will flash that thing in my mind and said, "You know this is not right." That's the Holy Spirit I serve. Now um, you can talk for yourself, but I'm 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 here to tell you as a pastor that this this concept of ministry that many of us have is that we're just looking for an opportunity to do what we want to do. That's all we're doing. We're, we're looking for an opportunity. That's why a person will go to their pastor and say, Pastor, I feel like it's time for me to move on. How do you feel that? How do you feel that? Tell me how do you feel that when the scripture says, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his rich and glory in glory. And he says, your gifts will make room for you. So that means if it's time for you, there is nothing that pastor can do to stop it because that, that ministry will flow through you in everything you do. 
Many of you have heard my testimony that way before I was pastoring, way before I was pastoring, God was trying me and testing me and God was putting me in circumstances that would allow to sift me to see um, to, uh, to sift me to see if what I said I had was really true. Oh, you said you are a minister. You said you are a minister. But do you minister? Jesus says, this is the ministry of Jesus. Jesus says, I did not come to save those who are well. So if your ministry is only for people that you like, that's not the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is for those who are sick, for those who got a problem, for those who got an issue. That's the ministry of Jesus. And guess what? Those people are going to be the worst people in your life. They're going to be the people that give you the messed up time. They're going to be the people that get on your last nerve. They're going to be the people that, that piss you off. They're going to be the people that aggravate you. They're going to be the people that smile in your face, but all the time want to take your place. Those are the ones that God sends you to, to minister. He don't send you to the one that says, amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're preaching. Go ahead, sir. Glory to his name. Oh God. Yes. You are so wonderful. Oh my God. That's such a great idea. You are so anointed. No, that's something that we will meet along the way. We'll meet the amen corners. But when you call, when you say that I'm called to minister, what God does, he tests your ministry. He tests your ministry against somebody who will give you a hard time. I'm pausing for effect. When you say you're called to ministry, God will test you. And, and if you're called to pastor, I'm going to help you tonight. If you're called to pastoring, your test is going to be in your family, with your relationships, with your children. With your family, your, your siblings, your mother, your father. Your test is going to be with them. Why? Because if you cannot overcome them, if you can't live righteously before them, if you can't stand in the midst of their test, then you cannot stand in the midst of a church test. Why? Because the Bible says, if you don't know how to take care of your own house, how can you take care of the house of God? So those of you who, who believe that you're called to, to ministry and you're called to pastoring and you're called to leading others in a pastoral uh, uh, shape or form that I'm here to feed the souls of people, tell me, can you break the ties, ladies, with your children? Husbands, can you break the ties of that controlling wife? Wife, can you break the ties of that sinful man? Can you, can you stand in the midst of them and still be holy, still be righteous, still glorify God, deal with their mess, deal with their junk, and still keep your praise, deal with their mess, still deal with their junk, and you're not falling out at the altar, but you're giving God glory and thanking him for another day? Can you deal with your children walking out on you and not be falling out saying, oh God, I'm lose my life. No, but you stand strong and stand still in the Lord. Because when you recognize that God is in control, what God does, he prepares you for the work that lies ahead of you. And so that means if I can't overcome them, then I will not overcome that stranger who gives me a hard time. I will not touch. If I, if, I, if I can't touch the messy things in my own household, then I won't touch that diseased person. If I can't be holy when my wife has turned her back on me, like, like with Job telling you to curse God and die, why do you hold on to your integrity? If I can't stand holy and still say, blessed be the name of the Lord God, I will rejoice and still be glad. If I can't do that, then I can't deal with church members who will lead me to go to another pastor because they didn't like what I said. Listen, so too many people are walking around and all you're doing is blaming the devil, blaming the devil. Oh, the devil is in them. 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 And the devil's like, I don't know what they're talking about. I'm not nowhere around them. It ain't the devil. It's your insecurity. 
It's your, your immaturity. It is your lack of development. It is your lack of preparedness to understand that ministry is more than just the bells and whistles. Ministry is more than just your name on the epitaph. Ministry is more than just your name on the banner and, and people applauding you. Ministry is stuff that people don't see. Not the stuff that people see. People don't see. What you do in secret, God will reward you openly. So a lot of people, they, they are not prepared and they don't know how to stand still long enough to be prepared. But what they do, they're so critical. I know people, even in my church, who they walk around because I don't move as fast as they want me to move, right? Then they start questioning the ministry. They start questioning uh, whether uh, he's a man of God or not. Are you kidding me? How many prayers have we prayed? How many times have we given you wisdom? How many times have we stood in your corner? How many times have we backed you up? How many times have you given you wisdom and knowledge and understanding? And even Jesus says, who do men say that I am? And then Jesus looked them right in the face and said, who do you say that I am? And then he told his disciples, he says, they said unto Jesus, they said, Jesus, show us the father. We want to see the father. And he says, have I been with you so long? Have I been with you this long time and you still haven't seen the father? Have I not ministered enough and you still not see the father? And, and this is the problem. Too many of us, we're looking for bells and whistles. We're looking for the signs. We're looking for the stuff that's going to make us feel great about ourselves. But let me tell you something. The work of the ministry is a, is a work of suffering. It's a work of burdens. It's a work of pain. It is a work of discipline. It is a work of humility. It is a work of, of, of servitude. It is a work of surrender. It is a work of denial. It is a work of dying. It is a work of, of me not getting my way. It is a work of rejection. It is a work of that's bloody. It is a work that is not the bells and whistles that so many people look at. Too many people, they want, too many people want the, the grandeur of ministry. They love when people announce their name and they come walking in with these long robes and monogram shirts and, 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 and French cuff shirts and cuff links and, and, and they love to walk in regal and, and they love to sound regal and deep and they love to, to sound like, oh my God, these people is, oh my God, they're so annoying. That ain't ministry. And I'm sorry, that's bad English, but that is not ministry. Ministry is when you are on your face before God and saying, God, let this flesh that's within me die because I hate it. It's when you are with a, a soul that is throwing up all over your clothes. They're throwing up all over your clothes, but you're casting out a demon. It is when a person is blind and you help them to see so that their lives can go on further. It's when your your family is falling apart because you, the people in your family don't want to follow you, but then you're going and you're helping somebody else's marriage. You're helping somebody else. It's not that you're not working on your own, but it's that you're being rejected because even Christ says Christ's brothers and sisters rejected him. They didn't believe he was the Messiah. They rejected him. They mocked him. And, and even the word of God said, his prophet does not have honor in his own country. It is important to know that Christ, he suffered. And that's ministry, suffering. So that's why God keeps you in the standstill. That's why God keeps you in the wait. That's why God keeps you in that stuff because um, you don't know how to suffer. And what do I mean by you don't know how to suffer? You don't know how to suffer and keep your mouth shut. See, we all suffer, but when we suffer, we want to fuss, we want to complain, we want to dog this one out, we want to dog that one out. You don't know how to suffer because you got to be quiet. 
You got to be quiet in the inside and on the outside, and you got to trust God. You got to trust God that in everything, God knows what he's doing. You got to trust him that God, you, you brought me here. God, you allowed this thing to happen. God, you allowed me to be put in this situation. You know how many times that my flesh wanted to run away from ministry and my flesh, and you know how many times I wanted to give up? You know how many times I wanted to run away? You know how many times I wanted to say, God, that's it. I can't take no more. But what do I I do. I go right back into the presence of the Lord, right back on my knees and on my face and say, God, kill this flesh that's trying to sabotage the work of the ministry that you have laid on me. Paul said, he says, I want to apprehend that for which I was apprehended. In other words, I want to achieve that for which I was apprehended. God called me for a purpose. And those of you who sense the calling of God on your life, God called you for a certain purpose, but you cannot, my God, help me, Holy Spirit, you cannot put your hands to the plow and then look back or let go because it gets hot. But the Bible says, if you put your hands, any man or woman or boy or girl that puts their hands to the plow and look, looking back, they're not fit for the kingdom of God. And too many of you, you think the ministry is something that, well, if it's good, I'll do it. And if it's not good, I'll quit. If, it's, if they treat me right, I'll do it. If they don't treat me right, I'll quit. And God said, you ain't fit. You ain't fit for the kingdom. And I'm sorry if I'm if I'm talking tonight to some of you that, that have quit on ministry. I'm telling you the reason why you quit because you wasn't properly prepared. The reason why you gave up, the reason why you ran, the reason why your flesh was telling you, no, you don't have to put up with this. Get out of here. The reason why that happened is because you're not properly prepared for ministry. And any pastor worth his salt any pastor worth their salt, if they, if you say that there's a calling on your life, if you say that there's an anointing on your life, or they discern an anointing on your life, they're going to prepare you for where you are going. They're going to prepare you and they're going to dig into you. They're going to get on your last nerve. They're going to delay. They're going to make you wait. They're going to make you do a lot of things so that you might develop the disciplines so that you might develop the resolve so that you might develop the patience so that you might develop the peace of mind that you need so that when you launch out into ministry, you don't give up because it gets tough. I want you to look with me. Let's look in the word of God. Let's, I, I've been talking the word of God all night, but I want you to look with me in first Timothy chapter three. First Timothy chapter three. Thank you, Lord. And when you get to 1 Timothy chapter 3, I want you to look at, we're going to look at um, verse 6. Verse 6 says, not a novice, lest being pumped up, puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil, Right? One of the number one things that I see in ministry and I see um, even in myself, and I'm, I'm going to share this with you because even in myself, what I do is that it is not a show, but when people give me accolades, when people, um, whether they're celebrating pastor's anniversary or, you know, they're doing whatever, celebrating my birthday or, or if people are even just complimenting me, right? Um, there's a whole lot of fear that's in my system, like that, not fear, but just Lord, keep me under the cross, right? Because the Bible tells us in Galatians chapter five, that in this flesh, there is pride. There's pride in this flesh. And so because of that, all of us, every one of you watching me tonight, you are capable of being prideful. Every one of us, some of you are really prideful, and others of you are not as prideful. Let me ask you a question. How can you measure whether or not you are prideful? How can you measure it? I'll tell you how you can measure it. If you feel good when people applaud you, and then you feel miserable or depressed or discouraged when they don't acknowledge you, you're prideful. Do you hear me? 
Anybody feels good when there's applause or people mentions their name or acknowledge them. Everybody feels good. But when folks don't acknowledge you and you catch a case, when folks don't say hi to you and you catch a case, when folks don't um, you know, hug you or kiss you or people don't invite you and you catch a case, you're prideful. You are not ready for ministry because your pride will cause you to fall into the same condemnation as the devil. God anointed Lucifer to be the archangel that covers. He anointed him and gave him a body, gave him all the tools and all the instruments necessary to cover properly. But the scripture says that because he became lifted up because of the abundance of his merchandise, he fell into pride and was cast down. Equally so, my friends, my brothers, my sisters, my sons, my daughters, my mothers, my fathers, equally so, when you have pride that's in your life, you will fall. The Bible says, not Pastor Rodney, the Bible says, and Pastor Rodney is just echoing it, the Bible says that before a fall, there's pride. In other words, God said, I will have no other God, no other idol or God before me. So when you are lifted up in pride, when you are not wrestling and dealing with the pride that's in you, what happens is that you run the risk of being knocked down by God. Many of you know the story of Saul, who later became Paul. Saul was on the road to Damascus with letters from the high priest, right, riding high on a horse. When the Holy Spirit met him through the personage of Jesus, he knocked him off his horse on his behind. And Saul's response was, who art thou, Lord? I'm here to tell you that there's only one Lord, there's only one God, and there's only one person on the throne. And that's our father. And I'm here to tell you, if you, as a minister, I'm talking to all ministers that are watching me tonight. As a minister, you must daily deal with your pride. Some of you got a lot of pride and some of you got a little bit of pride. But you must deal with it on a daily basis. You must get rid of that pride out of you. That means if you're sitting there and they acknowledge everybody and didn't acknowledge you and you're feeling some kind of way. Even sometimes we pastors, when we go to a church function and we see that church is functioning well and that church is giving their people love, sometimes pride will start to billow out of us because there'll be a little jealousy. There'll be a little envy. Right away, you need to deal with that and acknowledge it before God. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we deal with the pride that's within us. Why? Because we don't want our father to find pride in us. God bless you, Kayla. God bless you. Um, we don't want our father to find pride in us because it will knock us down. The scripture says, when it talked about Lucifer, it says you were perfect in all your ways until iniquity was found in you. So a lot of preachers and a lot of teachers, we're not dealing with pride in us. No, we're dealing with pride in others, but we're not dealing with pride in us. That, that desire, that seeking for glory, that seeking for acknowledgement, that seeking for, for favor and for, for folks to uh, uh, acknowledge what we've done and what contribution we made. Listen, you could do nothing without God. And the scripture says, if everything that you've been given has been given to you, why is it that you act as though it wasn't given to you? In other words, like you did it your own self. You, you pulled your boots, yourself up by your own bootstraps. You, you, uh, you worked hard. Well, I went to school and I labored and I went and I took all my degrees. It is sickening to me. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if, if you're ever invited to come to my church, know this. It is sickening to me when I hear a pastor or preacher come with this long doxology of all their accomplishments. 
I just want to know, are you saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and do you have a word from the Lord? That's all I want to know. I don't want to know nothing else. I don't care about your degrees because your degrees don't mean nothing to me. It is amazing to me that we, um, the folks read these long doxologies of all their accomplishments. And then after that, they go, okay, well, thank you for that glory. Now let's give glory to Jesus. All the glory belongs to him. All the, my God, help us, Holy Spirit. All the glory, all of the glory, all, 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 all inclusive, nothing left over. All of the glory. The scripture says, not unto us be any glory, honor, and praise. But unto you, O Lord, be all glory, honor, and praise. So why is it that we get upset when folks don't praise us? And when folks don't honor us? In fact, the pastor shouldn't be the last one that walks in the door. The pastor should be the one that walks in with a towel around his arm serving. We got it twisted, people of God, because we think that we're so saved. We think that we're so anointed. We think that we are so blessed. We think that we're so, oh, we're God's favorite that we can never have pride rooted in us. Listen, you can't get more perfect than Lucifer other than Jesus. You can't get no more perfect. And Lucifer tripped up because of pride. Any glory that you have, yes, Sheree, any glory that you have, any righteousness that you have, the Bible says before God is filthy rags. It's filthy rags. It's not even, it's not even clean. It, it is a dirty, nasty rag. It is a, it is a rag. It is disgusting before God. And so when we, when we talk about ministry, you can't tell me the things you believe God has called you to do. Because ministry is not about what you can do, but, but ministry is already going on by God. I'm going to prove it to you, okay? I want you to um, turn with me to 2 Corinthians. Thank you, Lord. Bless your holy name, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus. We glorify you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to look at verses 18 to 21. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21. Look at what it says. It says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of of reconciliation. So here's the first thing. The first thing is, and, and how can I say this nicely? The first thing is, you don't have a ministry. There's nothing, there's no ministry that's exclusive to you. The ministry that we all have is the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this ministry of reconciliation or reconciling, bringing the world who is lost in darkness back to our Heavenly Father, that ministry of reconciliation is a ministry that has different forms. But it's the, the ministry is reconciliation. Too many of us are preaching to save folks because we like the amen. You have a church that have great messages, great sermons, but the altar is barren. No children are being produced on the altar. The Bible says, when Zion travails, she brought forth. In other words, we bring forth souls into this world. Because the ministry that God has given us, whether you are a preacher, a teacher, a psalmist, whether you are um, a minister of music, like you play instruments, or, or whether whatever it is, in order for you to understand ministry, in order for us to get into the nuances of ministry and all the to-dos and to-don'ts, think, think about this, right? Your ministry must be reconciling somebody back to God. 
And this is why ministers of music that are watching tonight, this is why you can't play God's music, you can't sing God's music, and then at night be at the club singing R&B. Listen, I'm going to break this thing down and we're going to take our time with it and we're going to break it down because I think um, there's so many people that I've seen over and over again who do, who do not have proper training. And so because of that, they're incorporating all kinds of mess into God's church. They're incorporating all kinds of, of key changes and chord arrangements and themes that are from the world. Listen. Even myself, you know, in the world, I used to, you know, write love songs to my girlfriends. I used to listen to love songs and I like ballads. I like smooth ballads, you know, and every once in a while, if I'm not careful, right, something from a smooth ballad that I heard will, will sort of be incorporated in, in my vocal inflections and in my tonage and in certain chords and, and, and stuff like that. So it, it, it's, it, it, you got to be careful because your ministry that God has given you is a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the world back to him, not preaching and teaching to those who are already saved. Yeah, you know, there are times we testify to one another and there are times that we encourage one another and there are times that we minister to one another for where two or three are gathered in my name. God says I'm in the midst. But everything that we do is from a ministry of reconciliation. That's verse 18. Look at verse 19. He says, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trans trespasses to them and has committed to us the word a reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God was pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. See, this is why, you know, uh, many of us preachers, and I'm talking about us, many of us preachers try to sound so intelligent. Why? Because we're preaching to one another. And so if you went to, you know, seminary and, and you studied theology and you studied all kinds of teaching, biblical teachings and biblical instructions, then I must, when I preach to you, I got to preach telling you the Hebrew and the Greek. I got to preach telling you the, the, and use certain words, the syntax and synopsis. And I got to exegete the scriptures and I got to let you know that I'm skillful enough to teach you. The sinner wants to know why Jesus loves me. The sinner wants to know, can he save me? The sinner wants to know, God, if you can do anything, help me. The sinner doesn't want to, the sinner is not looking for your Greek. The sinner ain't looking for your Hebrew. The sinner ain't looking for how you can skip from Genesis to Revelation all over the place and you use these terminologies that are that are plain for Christians and for ministers and for pastors and for bishops and for apostles. Yeah, the apologetics, the, the hermeneutics and uh, the homiletics and, and all this like that. You know, the sinners are not impressed with that stuff. Because the sinners come to your church and they see you um, exegeting the scriptures in such a profound way, but then they see you got an attitude against your brother and sister. And Jesus says, by your love for one another shall the world know who you are. So if you hate me, you hate me because um, my ministry is different than yours, you're foolish. You're foolish. Because you don't read your scripture. You don't read your scripture and you don't understand the word of God that it was the apostle Paul who came with the ministry and nobody trusted him. But yet still God used him as a tent maker. God used him as the church builder. 
And Paul, whereas the disciples dealt with the governing issues, Paul dealt with the fine print. And so sometimes God got to use something different. Sometimes God got to bring somebody who doesn't care about no suit and no necktie and, and bow ties and, 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 and uh, I tie my bow tie too. And God ain't interested in using that person for that because that person don't mind sitting in the gutter on a curb talking to a drunk. And so we're hating one another because you didn't come to my anniversary. You didn't come to my, uh, my gala. You didn't come to this. No, I'm saving souls. What are you doing? And in fact, when I was studying this, um, you know, um, uh, my, my, my topic was going to be, you know, um, you know, what you doing? Right. But I didn't want my topic to sound like I'm being dogmatic or that I'm I'm being. Um, and, and as I was talking to the Holy Spirit, I said, Lord, I was like, what what can I give this topic? Because I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm not trying to say that Pastor Rodney got it right and everybody got it wrong. No, 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 no. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we all are on level ground before Jesus. It, Jesus is exalted. Jesus is high and lifted up. And we're all trying to become like him. But I'm saying and I'm pointing out that too many of us are hating on somebody else because they didn't get it like us. Too many of us are hating on somebody else because they don't act like us. Too many of us are hating on somebody else because they don't kowtow to our every whim. They don't bow. It's like, if you remember back in the Old Testament, it was with um, um, Esther's uncle. Esther's uncle got into trouble because he, Morde uh, Mordecai, he got into trouble because he wouldn't, um, oh yes, Teresa, I don't. There's a few pastors that I hang out with and there's a few pastors that love me and there's a few pastors that call on me and I minister at their churches. But for the most part, a lot of pastors don't even bother me. But you know what? Here's the funny thing. They don't know that I know you're watching because I hear them talking about the things that I teach. So that means you're watching. So you know that the Spirit of the Lord is in me. You know that the Spirit of the Lord is, is dealing with me. You know that the Spirit of the Lord is using me because souls are being changed. But yet and still, because I won't cow bow to you, and because I won't kowtow to you, and because I won't act like you are this high, exalted uh, ruler, because I won't act that way around you, but I see you as a man just like me. I see you as a human just like me. I see you as somebody who Jesus is trying to perfect through the power of the Holy Spirit just like me. I call you brother. I call you brother. I call you sister. If you are a pastor or elder, I will call you pastor. I will call you bishop, but I will not bow to your every whim. No, sir. I told everybody, I confess, here's my testimony. Jesus said, Jesus said, you're going to, he told his disciples, I want you to go and find this donkey that no one has tamed and no one has ridden and unloose him and bring him to me. And if anybody asks you, why are you untying that donkey? Say that the Lord has need of him. Listen, I spent many years, I spent many years running away from God. I spent many years acting the fool. I spent spent many years breaking hearts and being heartbroken. I spent many years shucking and jiving. Now it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. I don't care if I have another friend. I don't care if I get a woman. I don't care if you want to be my boo, my baby. I don't care about that. It's about Jesus now. And I'm here to tell you that because I want to be properly dressed. I want to be clothed before my father. I want God to be pleased with me. I want to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. I don't want to hate on nobody. I don't want to be angry with nobody. I don't want to be frustrated with nobody. I don't want to be envious of nobody. I don't want to be jealous of anybody. So what I'm looking at, the ministry that I'm starting with is the ministry of looking inside of me. What's going on inside of me? What junk is happening inside of me? What anger is happening? inside me. When my enemy comes up against me like a flood, am I really trusting the Holy Spirit or am I quipping back to render evil for evil? Listen, people of God, when you call yourself a minister, you got to learn how to stand still and let
let God fight your battle. He says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You don't need to cover yourself every time. You don't need to protect yourself every time. You don't need to come back with every comment that people make, especially those of us who are teaching on Facebook. Oftentimes we get hate mail. Oftentimes we get folks that's dogging us out. We get folks that call us names. So what? They call Jesus names. They call Jesus. And Jesus just told them, he said, listen, you can call me names, but woe unto you if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. So that means if what I'm doing, God has authorized me to do it, then you better be careful how you talk about me. And I really need to pray for you. I don't need to attack you back. I don't need to come at you. I don't need to quip at you. I don't need to call my members and say, go get them. I don't need to do none of that. I don't need to have no board meetings. I don't need to have no people saying, listen, we need to strip this one. We need to, they ain't no real pastor. I don't need to do that because here's the thing. When you hate on your brother, the Bible says you cannot love God. So you know what's going to happen? You're going to suffer. So what do I need to do to you? I don't need to do nothing. I don't need to do anything. I don't need, I just need to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. But what God will oftentimes do, God will call me to do something good for that person who despitefully used me. God will cause me to bless that person who's cursing me. God will cause me to speak well to that person when that person is dogging me out. God, why? Because it's about keeping this vessel clean. Let's, you know, he says that we, we are to become the righteousness of God in him. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. We are to become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I want you to look at this scripture in Isaiah uh, chapter 52, glory to his name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You just dip this in my spirit and, and Isaiah 52. When you get to Isaiah 52, I want you to look at verse 11. Isaiah 52, verse 11. In the name of Jesus, glory to his name. We bless your holy name, Father. We glorify you. We magnify your holy name. Look at what it says. Verse 11, Isaiah chapter 52. He says, depart. Depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, be clean, you who bear the vessel, vessels of the Lord. We are the vessels. So because you are the vessel of the Lord, what is the vessel? What is a vessel? Um, this cup is a vessel. Right now, this cup has tea in it, right? The tea is something that I prefer to drink at this time, right? So what I do before I put the tea in it, I make sure the vessel is clean. Why? Because if the vessel is not clean, it taints everything that I put into it. And too many believers, you want to get in ministry and you want to preach to other people but you're filthy in the inside. You want to get into ministry and you want to you want to be an elder or you want to be a pastor or you want to be a minister or you want to go out there and minister unto people, but you still got insecurities inside of you. You still got jealousy inside of you. Your vessel is filthy. He says that if you're going to bear the vessel of the Lord, if you're going to say, well, God, I want to use this temple so that your spirit might use me um, for your glory. I want to, I want this temple to, to, to be used for your glory. I'm going to say that again. I want this temple to be used for your glory. Here's the first ministry. Clean up your temple. Clean up your temple. That's the first ministry. Clean up. Your, don't talk about getting a title. Don't talk about going to a seminary. Because when you get to seminary, you're going to be preaching with a bunch of other preachers. You're going to learn certain techniques. You're going to learn certain uh, skillful ways to minister. Listen, people of God, I know what I'm talking about. I've been to seminary. But listen to this. Look into the Bible store. Go to the bookstore. You will find sermons for every occasion. You will find the section for pastors. The section for pastors are, is so broad. And everything is about ministry, what to preach on certain holidays, what to preach in this, how to do this, how to do this, how to do this, how to do that. Got so many books, 
So many people are not even trusting the Holy Spirit. You don't even know what the Holy Spirit is. In fact, if somebody came to your church with the Holy Spirit, you would just think that they had a fever. That's the feeling that you would give you. Boy, you hot. You must got a fever because you don't even recognize the Holy Spirit because all of your techniques are books. You go to seminaries to find out how to grow a church. The Bible never said for a pastor to grow the church. The scripture says the Lord adds daily such as should be saved. Your job is to minister. But we're going to these conferences to learn how to grow our church, to learn. We got folks, I got folks coming to me and they're coming to me online and saying, Pastor, your videos are good and your teachings are profound. But Pastor, I can help you reach more people. I don't need no help. The Holy Spirit is the one that took this ministry of, that he has given me to share the words with people of God. I had pastors that came to me and said, Pastor, you, you teach really well, but don't teach more than 15 minutes. My God, sometimes I've been on here for three hours, four hours, and people stayed on listening to the gospel, growing in the knowledge of God. That's not because of me. That's because of the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the power of the Holy Spirit spirit that leads and guides and inspires and calls for fire to come across these electronic lines into your, your vision, into your ears, into your hearts, and to burn away the sin and dross. That's not Pastor Rodney. That is the Holy Spirit of the living God. Because if I didn't have the Holy Spirit, then guess what? Everything that I said would be tinkling cymbals and sounding brass. Everything I said would just be words on the page. The Bible says the letter kills in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Thank you, Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. Look at what it says. And it says, and we have such trust through Christ um, toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves, to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Too many people are preaching the letter and they think just because it sounds good, it must be good. But I've been in services where someone said a few words and the Holy Spirit broke out in that place. And somebody, I went to other services where people dotted every I and crossed every T, had their introduction, had their body and their conclusion, had their bullet points, had everything lined up perfectly. And guess what? There was not an ounce of spirit in it. Too many people are going to master classes, but you haven't spent enough time on your master's knees. And at your master's feet. You haven't spent enough time there so that he can clearly fix you and clean the vessel that you are. To clean the vessel that you are so that when you pour out of that vessel to the people of God, you're not pouring out poison. But you're pouring out that which is clean. Okay, so ministry, ministry is not a list or a set of things to do that you do. Well, God has called me to do this and God has called me to do this and God has given me the ministry of this and God has given me this gift and God has given me this talent. No, ministry is you participating in what God is doing to reconcile the world back to himself. God is reconciling. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws it. So listen, my days of trying to intellectualize and convince you intellectually of the word of God is over. It is the spirit or nothing else. Jesus says, the words that I speak are spirit and they are life. It is important to know that we, the people of God, the only way we're going to speak in out of spirit is if our hearts are right before the Lord, right? Right before the Lord, where 
you you spend less time reading the commentaries and having your 15 and 16 books and and tablets and 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 computers and and Hebrew and Greek and you spend more time on your face saying God have mercy on me God forgive me God cleanse me Holy Spirit search my heart. See if there be any wicked way within me. That's true ministry. That's true ministry because it begins with the vessel. It begins with the vessel that's pouring out. It doesn't begin with what you poured out. It begins with the vessel. And I see people all the time, you got an attitude against somebody and then you want to come and minister in song. No, it's filthy. It's strange fire. It's garbage. And the only thing people can do is clap because you got a riff or a roll or you got some vocal prowessness. But there's no spirit because God is not flowing through that mess. So ministry is where you fall on your face and say, God, Lord, in me, there is no desire to love my enemy. But God, you said, for God so loved the world. You said in that while we were yet sinners, while we were yet enemies, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So equally so, I must love that person. Because hate is not of God. The scripture says he who hates his brother is not of God, but is of the devil. And I see people all the time, people who are, and, and the reason why the Lord sent me on Facebook to do these live Bible studies, because there was a whole lot of people that have strayed from the church, who got tired, disenfranchised, who were hurt, who were wounded, and they were running, but they were on Facebook. And every time I looked on Facebook, I saw these people posting these things that was half godly and half worldly. And I prayed and I said, Lord, what is this mess? And the Lord said, because these are my sheep that have wandered on every high hill. And so the Lord said, preach. I started preaching. I started teaching and I seek God for God. What do you want me to teach next? What do you want me? I'm not looking to get numbers. I'm not looking um, to, to, to break some million mark or, or, or whatever mark. I'm not looking for that. What I'm looking for is those who will turn away from your sins. Those who will come running back to your father. Those who have wandered far from the, from the courses of God's shores. Those who have strayed from the work of the ministry. Those who are called of God, but you're running around hanging in the club. Those who are drinking. Those who are caught up with alcohol and drugs and sex and all this stuff like that. I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you. And the Holy Spirit has sent me to preach this word to you. Come back home. Come back to your father. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. No, you don't have next year. Come now. Come now because of the fact of that tomorrow is not promised to you. And you don't want God to catch you with your works undone. You don't want God to catch you with, with, with being unclothed. The scripture says that there was a wedding there's a, there's a wedding. And, and that wedding, when he, when he came to the wedding, there was somebody that was in the wedding that wasn't clothed properly. He says, how did you get in here? And they cast him out. You don't want to be lost. You have one life to live. The scripture says, it is appointed unto every man to die. And after this, the judgment where God is going to judge you according to the deeds done in your body. He's going to judge you if you harbor in hatred. He's going to judge you if you have any unforgiveness. He's going to judge you according to every idle word spoken. He's going to judge you for every time you said something negative about somebody and you didn't know that, you, that God sent an angel to you unawares.
So ministry is not about doing stuff. Ministry is about that I have been joined with Christ. I have been joined with Christ into the ministry of reconciliation. I've been joined with Christ into the ministry of reconciliation. What is that? I have to discern where and which direction the spirit is moving. That's why we need to, we need to be able to discern the move of the spirit because sometimes that man, ladies, that man that's flirting with you on the bus, God allowed to use your beauty to get his attention. Don't get prideful. Don't get big headed, but discern that this is a believer. This is somebody who's seeking God. And for whatever reason, they've been drawn to me. There's been plenty of people that I've had in my life that's been drawn to me because they like the way I look or they like something about me or they like my voice or they like whatever, right? And then I have to be careful not to get caught up with the flesh stuff. With the flesh stuff, where the flesh goes, oh, they think that they like what they see. Oh, yeah, sugar booger. No, you got to remember who you are. And you got to remember that God has called you for a purpose that he is doing. And he wants you to join with him in this ministry of reconciliation. And now it's the Holy Spirit that tells you in what form he wants you to join with him. So whether it be in, in, in worship, in music, in prayer, in preaching, in teaching, maybe all of the above, maybe in playing music. So as a musician, you should be praying, God, what is the sound that you want to hear? What is the sound that your spirit will flow through? As a psalmist, not just um, tying songs together because it sounds good. No, but Lord, what is it What is it that you want to minister through? What song do you want to minister to? And oftentimes, if you follow the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will cause you to write your own. Because, let me help y'all out. A lot of the songs that we sing were written and performed and made popular by carnal saints. Saints struggling with homosexuality, Saints struggling with lesbianism, saints struggling with adultery and fornication, saints struggling with a whole lot of stuff. Jesus said that which is born of flesh will always be flesh and that which is born of the spirit will be spirit. So if, 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 if it originated from a flesh mindset, if they were in the studio saying, oh man, this beat is going to be rocking. And they weren't talking about glorifying God. It don't matter what the words say. Their intention behind it was to, to uh, enchant you. The intention behind it was to manipulate you and to draw you into it. So that's why they choose certain singers. That's why they choose certain singers that can give that song the color and the stuff that it is. Listen, I want to share this and I'm going to, I'm going to end tonight um, at this point because what we're going to do is tomorrow night, we're going to come back in and we're going to go part two on this and we want to go deeper into this, right? But I want you guys to understand this one thing. Um, there is a, a term that's called the latent power of the soul. The latent power of the soul. There was a writer named Watchman Nee. N-E-E, -E, Watchman Nee, who wrote this book called The Latent Power of the Soul. And what he illustrated in this book and what he talked about was how when, when God had the original relationship with man, it was God and man and that was enough. But once man was cast out of the garden because of sin, and once um, Cain and his children was cast out of the sight of God, then what would happen is that they longed for peace. They longed for joy. They longed for comfort. It almost reminds me 
of of um, uh, the, the the sons of Korah, the sons of Korah who rebelled against the man of God, against Moses, and the earth opened up and swallowed most of them, right? And, and, and they were destroyed. And if you read the book of Psalms and you read the Psalms that were written by the sons of Korah, you will see that all the Psalms that were written by the sons of Korah were songs that talked about, Lord, we long for your presence. Lord, we long to be near you. Lord, we long because... They, they felt this inner casting out because of what our forefathers did. They felt this inner shame, you know, because this was a part of our family. And they just wanted to be back in the presence of God, right? And so Watchman Nee um, um, talked about how ever since man was separated because of his sin from God, man has looked to manipulate to manufacture, manufacture, and to conjure up the Holy Spirit. Now, hear me correctly. There's a lot of people and a lot of churches that's trying to manufacture the Holy Spirit. So they're trying to give the songs and the things that will pull on your heartstrings and cause you to be weeping like a baby. Oh, God. Oh, God. But then you go home and still don't know how to talk to your spouse. You go home and you still don't know how to be holy. You go home and your life has not changed. And that is because you there was psychology, there was philosophy, there was ideology, there was a whole lot of stuff that's used. And in this day and time, a lot of pastors, a lot of leaders, a lot of ministers, what you're learning is technique. Paul says, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech. He says, why? I didn't come with philosophy. I didn't come with psychology. Why? He said, because I didn't want your faith to rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's why the word of God said in Timothy, they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof, the power to change you, the power to transform you the power to renew you, the power to, to, to transform that mind, the power to cause that wife who's been fussing and complaining to come home and to still give God glory and to serve her husband. The, the power that will give that husband to walk uprightly before his wife, although he wants to leave her and go and be with somebody else. The power to stand holy and pure in our bodies, the power to say no to sin. Yes, Teresa, it's charisma, charisma that's being used, very charismatic, skillful, mental, intellectual, um, uh, 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 geographical, um, you know, social, you know, things that are relative to the time. And there's all this stuff and in inner workings that a whole lot of folks who are, and I don't mean, listen, I ain't trying to dog out seminary and I ain't trying to dog out Bible school because I believe that in some ways they have their place. But I'm here to tell you, a lot of what is being taught today is technique. Technique. Skillful technique. Listen. The Bible says the word of God in Hebrews is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, bone and marrow, the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And it says, and there is no creature that is not manifest in its sight. But this word, you can't be skillful to use it. God has to give you the skill to use it. God has to empower you. To use it. You can't go to school to learn how to, no, all you can go to school to do is to learn how to manipulate and to learn how to use philosophy and psychology on God's people, to try to intellectualize the word. 
to try to make it sensitive to the to the ladies, to try to make it strong and powerful to the men, to try to make it uh, free and charismatic for the children. You know, that's all most most people that's coming out of these schools are learning. I, I've known plenty of people, and some may be watching tonight, that before you went to, before you got the certificates, before you had the library behind you, before you had all the rewards and the ordinations and the doctoral awards and the master's degrees and the bachelor's degrees before when it was just you and God. It was you, your knees, your fasting, your praying, your seeking God's face through his holy word. You didn't have Bible dictionaries and concordance and and, and laptops and computers. You didn't have none of that stuff. You didn't have commentaries. You didn't have any of that stuff. You didn't have Greek and Hebrew and parallel Bibles and, and, and today's English Bible. No, you sat there and you prayed. And you said, Holy Spirit, open up my understanding. And the Holy Spirit dipped into your spirit out of his holy word. The words of life. It reminds me of this old song that I used to love in the house of God. And, it, and, and the song says, sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. This is the, the, the root. And, and if I can use this as the first part, first part of this teaching on the prepared minister, the first part is, have you disconnected yourself from God? And you're now caught up in all the stuff. You don't pray as much as you used to. You don't sit quiet in the room and, and read the word like you used to. No, no, but you, you became smarter now so you could take one scripture and develop a whole sermon. You became skillful. So you can, you can look at a topic and some may be looking in their tablets or their laptop and looking for uh, some study notes that they had to say, let me see what would be a good message for today. No, have you sat down and said, Holy Spirit, lead me. Give me fresh manner from heaven. Give me fresh manner from heaven. Not stuff that will excite the flesh, but stuff that will transform the mind, that will convert the heart, that will renew the spirit. Give me words of spirit and of life that I can share with your people because when we recognize those of us who are pastors and ministers and, and teachers and bishops and apostles, we recognize, we recognize that, guess what? These are not my people. It's not my church. Oh yeah, we say my church, I say my church, but it's not my church. It is the church of the living God. The scripture says, no other foundation can be laid than that which was already laid. And it tells us that we need to be careful how we build upon it. Because if it's not tried in the fire, if it's not birthed by the Holy Spirit, it cannot stand. And so my encouragement to you tonight, get back to that place. Get back to that place where it's you and God. Yeah, if you have a degree, that's wonderful. If you have education, that one, that's wonderful. The Holy Spirit will pull from those resources. But look at what the Holy Spirit did. The Holy Spirit took educated Paul and sent him to uneducated Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit took uneducated Peter and sent him to educated Jews. Because what did the scripture says? The scripture says, we have this, 
heavenly treasure in earthen vessels. Why? So that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. It's not you. Ministry is not a list of to-dos. It's not a list of what you can do. It's not a list of, of, of what your talents are. No, ministry is already being done every single day. For God is reconciling the world to himself. The question is, are you participating in that? Are you participating in God's ministry of reconciling the world back to himself? Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for your word is truth. Lord, we give you glory, honor, and praise. And Father, I ask firstly that you would search our hearts. And if any of us, Lord God, those watching both now and hereafter, if any of us have fallen short of your glory and we have, Lord God, have lost our first love, Lord God, and we have forgotten that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We are not the authors, but you are the author and finisher of our faith. So God, help us to no longer preach ourselves. Help us, Lord God, as teachers and preachers to no longer magnify our own office, to no longer magnify what we can do, so that we no longer would spend so much time talking about I, I, me, me, I, I, me, me but that, God, we would talk about Jesus. For the work of Jesus and the powerful work of the Holy Spirit is what's really necessary. Father, we're living in end times and the signs are all the way around. And Lord God, we see the enemy and the Antichrist and everything approaching faster and faster. And Father, this world is going deeper and deeper into sin and deeper and deeper into distortion and false truth, Lord God, and deeper and deeper into error, it is now high time for the children of God to light their lamps. So Holy Spirit of the living God, I pray God that you would inspire your people tonight to light their lamps, to light it with the fire of the Holy Spirit, so that our lamps might be trimmed and burning. Help us, God. Help us, God, if we're prideful, if we become arrogant, if we become, Lord God, complacent. Help us. Forgive us. And put us on that straight and narrow path. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and grace. But God, we recognize that your word says that you are not mocked. The soul that sinned shall surely die. So God, we ask that you would forgive us and that you would grant us life. Bring us back to that place. Restore to us the joy of thy salvation. Help us, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, and give us a perfect walk before you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right now, I just want to um, share with you all, I want to take a moment just to share with you all, uh, those of you who are watching me tonight, I don't want to take it for granted that you are born again. If you're not born again and you would like to be born again, if you're not a child of God, if you have turned away from God, if you have um, forgotten your father, if you are living a life that you know is not pleasing in sight, won't you put in the comment feed, Pastor, pray for me. I want to come back home. Just, just, just put that, I want to come back home. If you've strayed away from God, just put that in the feed. I want to pray specifically for you that God would forgive you of your sins and that the Lord will um, restore your life in him. And if you've never had a life with him, that the Lord will give you and grant you eternal life tonight. And so if that's you, just say, Pastor, I want to come back home. And if you've never been in the kingdom of God, say, Pastor, I want to be born again. Just put that in the feed right now. I will wait for a few seconds in the name of Jesus. Um, saints of the living God, just begin praying. Begin praying in the name of Jesus for the soul, for the soul. Hallelujah. God bless you, Tasha. Amen. I'm praying for you right now. I'm going to pray for you right now. 
We got Tasha. Amen. Glory to his name. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Glory to his holy name. Father, bless the soul. Bless the soul. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We got Elizabeth. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on. Come on. There's more of you out there. Amen. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Eloise, God bless you. Hallelujah. I'm just writing down your names because I'm going to pray for each of you right now. We're just waiting to see if there's more um, coming. More coming in the name of Jesus. If you're out there and you're not born again, if you're out there and you strayed away from God, it's time for you to come back home. It's time for you to come into Christ before it's everlasting too late. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another moment because not another moment is promised to you. And I don't say that to threaten you. I say that to tell you the truth. And it is my duty as God's servant to tell you that you must be born again. You must be gone. I see you, Jasmine. Amen. Hallelujah. We thank God for you. Amen. Amen. We're going to pray for each of you now. For those of you who said, who said so, don't go nowhere. Stay right there. Stay right there until we get everybody in. In the name of Jesus, I don't want to miss nobody. Come on. You just type those words. Type those words that I want to be in Christ. I want to come in Christ. I want to be in Christ tonight, not tomorrow. Amen, Trina. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Geraldine, God bless you. Amen. God bless you, Mary. Amen. Mary, before we pray for your family, we want to pray for you. You first. Because if salvation comes to you, then salvation will come to your household. Because God will change you and he will do a mighty work in your household. This is about you. You can't go before God for you and your family. Not now. It's about you. Get you right and then the Holy Spirit will work through you to change your family. Because your family may never come on this live Bible study. So you are the difference maker. And so is there anyone else before we begin to pray? We don't want to miss you. We don't want to miss you in the name of Jesus. We don't want to miss you. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit of the living God, touch that heart right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit of the living God, open their eyes that they might see. In the name of Jesus, open their eyes and their ears that they might hear, Lord God. In the name of Jesus, transform them, Father, right now in the name of Jesus. We glorify you, Father. We bless your holy name. All right, I'm going to give you 10 more seconds, 10 more seconds. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this opportunity. This is your chance. This is your season. This is your opportunity. If you want to be in Christ Jesus, say, I want to be in. You're not in right now, but you want to be in. I want to pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. We got, we got folks praying for you right now. We got the kingdom of God right here on this video line. And so we want to give you the opportunity in the name of Jesus. Amen. Too often we've been celebrating sin. We have our children sinning. We have our family sinning and we celebrate their sin as if there's nothing wrong with it. We, we celebrate it, in, but, but time out for that mess. We need to tell our children, you're in sin. My son, my daughter, you are in sin. It's not good what you're doing in the name of Jesus. So right now we're going to begin praying for these. Let me see. We got seven people so far. Is there anyone else? Before we begin to pray, I'm trying to give you the opportunity because we want you to be included. We want your, your presence in this, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Paulette, God bless you. I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me there was somebody else. Amen. Thank you for your boldness in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to begin to pray. We got these eight individuals. Here's the beautiful thing. These eight individuals represent a new beginning. Eight is a number for new beginning. It is important to know that God wants you to be made new. It is not Pastor Rodney. It is not my prayer. It is not anything that I have other than what the Holy Spirit has given me. Like Peter said at the gate called beautiful, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus, walk, rise up and walk. And so right now we're going to pray for you. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to call your name. I want you to pray with me. 
I want you to realize that God says that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. It's not a big matter in the sense that it requires so much. It's not a big matter. It is that you are you desire him and you say, God, forgive me and come into my heart and save me. Right? Very simple. But I'm going to pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We bless your holy name. And right now, God, even as I extend my hands right now to this video, Lord God, I pray right now for Paulette Hoskins. I pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord God, that God, you would forgive her of all of her sins and that God, you would cleanse her from all unrighteousness. Not only her, God, but we pray for Tasha Ellis. Lord God, we pray for Elizabeth. We pray for Eloise, Lord God. We pray for Jasmine. We pray for Trina and Geraldine and Mary Parker. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that right now that you would snatch them from the power of Satan. Snatch them from everything that they have run away from you from. God, if they're hiding in the midst of the trees, call them by name. And God, we pray in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you would cause them to be born again in the name of Jesus. Give them your life. Give them your power. Give them your anointing. Give them your, your, your favor. Give them your spirit that they might be included in the beloved. God, we thank you for their willingness to acknowledge their flaws, to acknowledge their faults. But you told us, God, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, right now, I pray that even now as the words were spoken and you have increased their faith, to desire you, to long for you, to need you, God, I pray that you would grant them their heart's desire in the name of Jesus. And that, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would break the control of Satan in the name of Jesus. Break his every witchcraft, break his every delusion, break his deafness and his blindness in the name of Jesus. Break every link, every shackle, every chain in the name of Jesus. Every bad habit, Lord God, every addiction in the name of Jesus and set these people free in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit of the living God, set them free for your glory. For your name's sake, Jesus, set them free in the name of Jesus. And we thank you right now. And by their confession, God, we thank you and we bless you and we honor you and we give you glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, for those of you who have um, said that you want the Lord to be in your life, I want you to repeat this after me. I want you to repeat this after me. I don't want you to whisper it. I don't want you to move your lips and, and just whispering your lips or moving your lips or mouthing the words. I want you to speak out. I want a sound from your voice to say these words, right? So I want you to follow me. Everybody who I prayed for, I want you to follow me right now in the name of Jesus. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you and I thank you for Jesus who died on the cross for me. I thank you that he paid the price for my sins. For God, you said, the wages of sin or the payment for sin is death, but your gift is eternal life. So Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me for all of my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Remove from me rebellion and give me a heart that loves you. Create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit. And in Jesus' name, make me your child. Save me. Deliver me. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. Amen. 
Hallelujah. My friends, my sisters, Paulette, Tasha, Elizabeth, Eloise, Jasmine, Trina, Geraldine, Mary, if you prayed that prayer and you believed it from your heart, you are a child of the King. You are a child of the King. And the scripture says when we become born again, God gives unto us his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit makes us his own. He said, because if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, God bless you, Tasha. Amen. He says, if anyone doesn't have the Spirit of God, they're none of his. So if you prayed that prayer, know this, you have the Holy Spirit within you. It's not about a feeling. It's not about an itch. It's not about anything else. It is about by faith. The scripture says that Jesus came unto his own. You're welcome, Tasha. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He said, but to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God. God bless you, Elizabeth. You're welcome, Mary. He says he gives you power. So guess what? You may not know it, but there's power inside of you right now. How is that power made powerful? By the word of God. So I'm going to ask you, get into Bible study. You can go and look at some of my videos. You can go, but the best thing is to open up your Bible. Ask the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, speak to me. And just start reading. Start reading and meditating on that word daily. Meditating on that, that word daily in the name of Jesus. And then as you meditate on it, you're going to find that word becoming living inside of you. And the Holy Spirit will walk with you. The psalmist says, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me, I'm his own. And the joys we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. So God is going to walk with you. You're not alone. You're not alone. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you, but I'll be with you always, even until the ends of the earth. And so as long as earth is still standing, you know God is with you. And so every time, every problem you have, if you feel yourself getting tempted, say, Holy Spirit, help me that I would not fall. If you find yourself getting depressed, Holy Spirit, help me and give me your joy. And he'll do that. But stay in the word. Stay prayerful. Stay prayerful. And reach out to me through messenger and stuff like that. And we'll minister to your hearts to get you strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And so God bless you all. I look forward to continuing with you. God's willing tomorrow evening. Um, it probably won't be until 9 p.m. Because I have Bible study at the church at 7 p.m. And so um, uh, I'll go to the church and then I'll come home and then I'll start part two. And so God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. God bless you, Earlene. In the name of Jesus, God bless you, Elizabeth. Amen. God bless you. Yes, yes. Yes, Elizabeth. That's right. Call on him. You have to call on him every time. Call on him. I call him every time. Good night, my brother Lamont. Good night, Lauren. Lauren, I'm praying for your uncle. God bless you. Lauren, I miss you on Sunday. Amen. So God bless you all. God bless you, Tasha. God bless you, Melinda and Mary. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Tricia. All right, Lauren. Remember, Lauren, the word of God says that if you're sick, you must call for the elders of the church. We need to know. Okay. Melinda, God bless you. Michelle, God bless you. Demetria, God bless you. All right, Lauren, I'll see you tomorrow. Elizabeth, yes, go to work. God bless you. Elder Nicole, God bless you. Have a good night. A 
bless you, Edna. Have a good night. Angela, have a good night. God bless you. Lisa, God bless you. Have a good night. Amen. God bless you, Trina. God bless you, Teresa. God bless you. Eloise, God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. My brother Isaiah, God bless you. God bless you, man. Tasha, you're welcome. God bless you. Good night. Zena, God bless you. God bless you all. Okay, everyone, have a blessed evening. In the name of Jesus. God bless.